Functional health is something I'm pretty passionate about. My favorite way to put it is that I would rather heal my issue than just put a Band-Aid on it. Today, we will be focusing on functional health and lifestyle medicine. My guest is a functional chiropractor, integrative health practitioner, and podcaster with a master's in applied clinical nutrition. As a former athlete, she is passionate about teaching people how to bridge the gap between fitness and holistic health. She has helped thousands of people all over the world regain their health through lifestyle, optimal diet, movement, and functional practices. Her main goal is to help you be the alpha of your health by understanding what being optimally healthy means for you, which she has done so in creating Alpha Health and Wellness. Dr. Haley Schaff, welcome to Inside Voice. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming, especially because I know you're probably already in vacation mode. Uh, you're getting ready to travel to Costa Rica in, in what, less than a week? Yeah, I, we leave on Wednesday. So yeah, uh, six days. So but no, this is perfect because I'm I'm like still like very much so in work mode next week. Maybe not as much so, but like I'm really just getting a bunch of stuff done. I've got to record a bunch of podcasts before I leave. So this is good. It's like getting me in podcast mode because I'm kind of already in in work mode. So it's oh, perfect. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I I feel that because I feel like the week of my trip, you know, like if I leave on a Thursday, like on Monday, I need to be in work or in vacay mode, like packing, no. getting everything together. Otherwise, I'm bound to forget half of I know. <laughs> and I'm the, I'm like that weirdo that I need my house to be completely spotless when I'm going away for a week. Like, I don't know why, like whenever we leave, like I need to just like deep clean the house because I don't want to come home and have it be messy. So like, that's what I'll be doing all next week. <laughs> yes. Oh, I feel that. I feel that. Um, well, so I, I, like I said in your intro, I love all things functional health, wellness, uh, holistic practices, all the things that you are about, um, which led me to wanting to have you as a guest on here because I've followed you on social media. I see all the content that you have to post, the great tips, advice, all the things that you have to share. And I love it. Thank you. So, and I'm so happy to be here to like talk about all things, hormones, gut health. Like I, I just feel it's so cool to see that so many people are being gravitated towards yes. natural healing or kind of finding, okay, I've had these symptoms. Why do I have these symptoms? Like what's, what's at the root of a lot of what I have going on versus, you know, just putting a bandaid on things. And I do feel like there's a huge trend to that. So I love, I love, I love to see it. 100%. I just shared something the other day. Um, I think it was yesterday actually on my story and it was a meme and, or like a, it was a graphic and it said, um, you know, in my healing my gut health, uh, setting boundaries, some a whole bunch of things era. So basically, like, this is the time that people are finally like, okay, why do I feel like crap all the time? I want to fix this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm tired of taking a pill. I'm tired of, you know, going to the doctor and the doctor keeps telling me I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think this, this is this episode is going to be amazing. I'm so excited. Me too. Me too. So I want to just dive right in um, and start talking about what uh, led you to this side of chiropractic and eventually led you to starting Alpha Health and Wellness. Yeah. So, I mean, I've always been very interested in health and nutrition. We always grew up just, I mean, even looking back at like what I did when I was younger, like we've evolved so much along the way, but like we never had kind of like the standard American things in our household. Like we were always kind of trying to eat right and all that type of stuff. And so I've always been very interested in nutrition and I've, I've, I'm very grateful that my parents raised just how they did and it's continued to blossom and grow and evolve ever since, which I'm very appreciative of. And so when I got into the field of chiropractic, getting into chiropractic school, knowing that it's so funny, I actually, I, when I graduated high school, I thought I wanted to be a pharmacist because I, I want to help people. Right. Um, I did a lot of shadowing. And then in my undergrad, I was like, this is just not the way I want to go. Like, this is, this is not. Yeah. You went like totally op opposite end of the spectrum. Totally opposite. So that <laughs> totally opposite. Yeah. Cause I didn't really know, right. Like you in high school, you hear they make a lot of money, you know, you, mm -hmm. you just go to school for six years and then you're doing this thing and it's like, you're helping people. I was like, okay, like that sounds like a good deal. It's so it's so irresponsible to ask an 18 year old what they want to do for the rest of their life. They don't, we don't know. I don't know anything. I'm such a different person. 
you know, like I, my, my interests and my, like who I just am as a person is so different. So to be like, you need to pick exactly what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Thankfully, I knew that it was something that had to do with science that was health and wellness based. So it's not like I was an English major and then all of a sudden I'm like, nope, I'm actually going to go do this. Like I, I I was still kind of in the same realm. Um, I was very, I loved biology. I loved biochemistry. I loved all that stuff. So then I had my first experience with a chiropractor when I was playing college softball and just, I mean, I was in a lot of pain. And so being able to walk in there, walk out, being in a, a immense amount of relief, I was like, how can I do that? Because that was amazing. And just being able to like, she didn't give me any pills. She didn't give like nothing. It was a very natural and preventative approach. And so that's kind of what got me into that realm, getting into chiropractic school. I, you know, a lot of people I went to the chiropractic school, we were ex, you know, previous college athletes, like very active, like we loved living a healthy lifestyle. I loved all of that. I felt like very much so I don't know, like it was just kind of like a good, an amazing group of people to be at school with. And, you know, we're all kind of like here wanting to do this purpose. And so then within school, um, you know, we have a lot of different nutrition courses just built into our curriculum, which I love, like that always was my jam. I was always so interested in that. And then my own kind of like hormone journey snuck in there because at that time I was going off of birth control and I was having like a slew of just hormonal just chaos. And so I was kind of like in school in the thick of all of this, like boards and clinic and all this stuff. And I'm trying to heal my hormones and I'm trying to figure out what the heck it was such a blessing in disguise though, because that's kind of what kickstarted me into really diving into like this subset of health that is amazing. I mean, there's so many people who struggle with hormonal issues or who were, have been on birth control since they were 16 and they want to know what the heck's going on with their hormones. They don't want to have to take a pill to heal their acne or they don't want to have to take a pill to prevent, pre like people want to know how their hormones work because we're not really told those things. And so it's kind of all of my interests and passions have kind of gelled into now what I do. Um, I still very much so do chiropractic. I was in the office this morning before we were recording this. And, um, but I've, I've kind of transitioned into this functional space. And I, I probably, as much as I, you know, COVID was horrible. COVID also kind of like pushed me into this space. Like nobody was going anywhere. No one was doing anything. Like I can do nutrition and functional health from anywhere. So that like really kind of pushed me into this realm of like, Hey, we can get testing and it can be drop shipped to your house. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. We can do everything virtual. So that really kind of put me into kind of the whole remote space, which is majority of my practice. Now um, I still do treat locally. I'm here in the Finger Lakes in New York and that's amazing. I love it. I love the in-person aspect to a lot of it, but it's so cool. I mean, I I met with someone from Dubai yesterday. I've worked with people in the, in Qatar and Bangladesh and the UK. Like it's so cool because like hormones and all that type of stuff can be helpful no matter where we are, right? So right. it's it's very cool. I love what I do. I'm very passionate about it. And um yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell how I got to where I am today. And so rewarding too, because you feel like you're, you're really making a difference in their life. You're finding the root issue and healing that rather than just, well, here, take this or let's, you know, take this and we'll see if that works. If not, we'll add another one on it. So I think, I think that's awesome. And definitely a career that I can see being so passionate in like you are. So, yeah, it is. And, you know, and it definitely doesn't come without struggles because it just, I, it's, you know, with the food system and just our society as a whole, like we just are not sometimes set up for as much success with just what's in our food and all that type of stuff. So just even like teaching people like ingredients to look out for things that we want to be limiting to prevent bloating or to help our digestion or to decrease inflammation. I mean, it's definitely sometimes feels like an uphill battle, but at the end of the day, I mean, it definitely is very rewarding and and I mean, I, I, I would not do it if I didn't, if I didn't love it as much as I do. So what I've always thought was interesting is that every functional medicine doctor that I've come across, at least, um, it were chiropractors. And, and I've always funny. thought that was so interesting because I'm like, I think chiropractor and I think someone that's going to adjust my back, my neck, yeah. which definitely is, is part of it. But 
after looking into it, um, I read that chiropractic is actually the focus on the body's ability to self-heal, which includes treatments such as nutrition and exercise. And mm-hmm. so I that to me was like, whoa, OK, now it makes so much sense. And and I love mm-hmm. that. I love what that means, you know, um, because the body has the ability. Exactly. And we get so much like we got a ton of nutrition and all that type of stuff within our curriculum anyways. And I feel like those of us that really wanted to branch out into the extra, I mean, there's so many just extra things that, or, you know, continuing education things that you can like really branch out and kind of nerd out a little bit based on whatever you're learning about. But yeah, I mean, really, I mean, if you look back years ago, I mean, they kind of were like the OG, like functional kind of, practitioners um and and i think naturopath definitely dates back quite a ways too but um and it's so funny because they've kind of been termed as quack or whatever by kind of mainstream because it's it's obviously not the mainstream model but i feel like it's definitely becoming so much more um accepted it's not like what's chiropractic it's more who is your chiropractor i mean sports teams and all these different you know huge organizations are are now utilizing which is just it's cool definitely for the field of what I do and you know where kind of I started so it's definitely nice to see that people are kind of changing their tune and even like within the last 20 years yes for sure um can you explain what functional health is versus like your western medicine sure um, for listeners who may not quite know the the difference as much so the way I think of functional health is not just I want to get rid of xyz symptom or like I have high blood pressure so I just take something and I get rid of it functional health to me is like why do I have high blood pressure why do I have diabetes why do I have PCOS like you know not just okay here's like conventional is kind of like here's the diagnosis here's what we do about it like a plus b equals c functional is kind of um it's not as cut and dry because there's so many different, it's essentially, it's like looking at you like a whole person. It's okay. I know that this might be dealing with like your hormonal system, but what is causing your hormones to be off in the first place? Is it your gut? Is it your adrenals? What, you know, what is it toxic burden? It's so it's taking you, but it's also not looking at you in different subsets. Whereas in conventional medicine, you've got your endocrinologist, you've got your primary care, you've got a gastro, you've got all these different things where it's like, yeah, they all kind of talk and they all maybe work together, but maybe not as efficiently as it would if you were having somebody who is versed in kind of how the body works as a whole, not how it works individually, because everything communicates together. I mean, mm-hmm. your hormones are direct communic- communication messengers of everything. Like there's hormones that communicate with your thyroid, that communicate with your pancreas, that communicate. I mean, everything goes together. And I mean, even just looking at your gut health, how gut health is tied to mental health, it's tied to blood sugar balance, it's tied to metabolism, it's tied to your hormones. So just being able to just, okay, just look at your GI system. I mean, that's not looking at it completely in like a whole picture. Um, So the way I kind of see like conventional medicine has an amazing place, especially with acute care. I mean, if I break my arm, I'm not putting essential oils on it that's going to make it heal. Like maybe I'll use some things like help calm me down. But like, I do feel and I don't ever want to come at the by saying like what I do is the only thing that people need. Like there is definitely a place for conventional aspects. But in terms of like living a more preventative lifestyle and being able to figure out why we have such a high rate of chronic disease and not even just chronic disease, maybe you're not someone who's ever been diagnosed with something, but you don't feel hundred percent optimal, or you don't feel like you used to 10 years ago. Like that's kind of where I feel let's figure out kind of the root cause for this. And it kind of can dive even deeper when I look at even conventional labs, like say you go, you get blood labs done. I follow a little bit tighter of a range um, because a lot of conventional things are very large subsets of ranges based on a very unhealthy population. So essentially they figure out the ranges based off of like the average of people. I don't know about you, but I don't really, I don't want to be an average American right now. Um, That's not really leading us anywhere (laughs) promising. So uh, certain functional practitioners can kind of go off of a smaller 
range for for certain types of labs. And that's just kind of one example. But just to kind of show there's a little bit of a difference where we're not just like, okay, you're not quite there. You're not quite at the disease state. But I will hopefully catch it and say, okay, yeah, you're not at prediabetes, but you know, there might be some trajectory. Right. Like if we continue on this road, that can be where it leads. So right, you know, I think Mm -hmm. I think both worlds in a in a perfect world could work really well together. Um, and I don't want it to be like an us versus them type of a thing, but there definitely is, you know, the, the system definitely needs support. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, so let's talk gut, gut health, um, okay. because I know you just mentioned that sometimes like gut health, like if you have poor gut health, it leads to so many other different things. Like it kind of just starts there and just it can mm-hmm. affect so many different things. Um, So something I know that many of us are dealing with these days is gut health, poor gut health, Um, and myself included. I have had years of trying to figure out what is going on with my gut. Why can't I eat certain foods? Um, Mm. I'm fairly healthy. I'm young. Like, I I don't understand why I'm always having to pop a Tums or, like, lay down because I don't feel good or all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, and And I know so many people my age... Are dealing with this as well because I hear it all the time and I'm like yeah that's mm-hmm. not normal at all which is why I have I personally have sought out functional medicine help because my you know primary care my gas gastro I can never pronounce this word gastro I know it's hard gastroenterologist <laughs> yes thank you um <laughs> it's it, a tough, it, it was there are tough words yeah it was just but it was I was getting diagnoses that were like oh it's IBS oh it's it's this, it's this. And I'm like, okay, but why? And, you know, cause I'm not really doing anything to cause that. Right. Um, and so what are the leading causes to poor gut health that you see? Mm. Okay. So I think a big overarching would be stress, but stress can be a bunch of different things. Stress can obviously be mental and emotional stress. So I mean, a lot of people just in general are chronically like running from the tiger on a daily basis, whether Mm -hmm. we're stuck in traffic, we're going through the pickup line to get the kids from school and then run them to like the a billion after school activities, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it is. Um, A lot of people are definitely stressed, but stress can also be uh, coming from different foods that might cause more inflammation or stress can be coming from. Um, I mean, big ones like alcohol, gluten, I mean, here in the United States, over in other countries, a lot of people can tolerate stuff like that a lot better. It's less inflammatory. Uh, But certain, I mean, inflammatory oils, like the seed oils, things like that, things that are just kind of like on a micro daily basis, like tiny stress, tiny stress, like eventually like that bucket fills and our body can't tolerate it as much anymore. And so that's why when you start minimizing stuff like that, it sometimes it's not as much of an overnight fix because it's kind of like that cumulative bucket. You've put a little bit in, a little bit in, a little bit in, and then all of a sudden it's kind of starting to overflow. So when we start to take a little out, people are like, oh, you know what? Well, I ate clean for a few days and you know what? It didn't do anything for me. So I'm just going to go back to eating who I was before. And I was like, no, 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 no. I promise you. This is years of buildup. Yeah, this is years of (laughs) buildup. Exactly. So and that's what's frustrating is people have been dealing for XYZ symptom for years and if they don't get results in a few weeks, they're like, oh, well, it's just not working. And I was like, no, 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 it, it, it doesn't mean that it's not working. It just means we, you know, we're so used to we have a fever or we have a bacterial infection, we take antibiotics, and we're better maybe within 12 hours, right? Like, we're such like a quick, we instant need results, and we need it instant. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's kind of where the side of what I do is sometimes like talking people down a little bit. It's like, no, 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 we are still making tons of progress. Like, look, you're, you're noticing that your rings fit a lot, you know, less tight, or you're, you're noticing less puffiness, you're having regular bowel movements, your energy is really good, just because we aren't noticing XYZ complete 180 turnaround doesn't mean that we're still not seeing good results. So um, I, I say stressors, because again, there's so many things that can cause stress to the gut, whether it's a food or a food additive or actual stress, uh, or potential toxic burdens, whether that's from pharmaceutical or lifestyle. I mean, so many different, just even personal care products or things that are in our home are kind of like these endocrine disruptors can create a lot of stressors on the gut. And especially as it relates to hormones, but it's so important because 
70 to 80 percent of our immune system they it lives in our gut and so it's a huge way that our our body makes antibodies and helps to uh heal chronic infections or even acute infections i mean people when you look at people who have good gut health i mean gut health is such a buzzword but it's i mean it's it just works uh versus people who you know they have all these gi symptoms and it's, and gut health does not have to just be gi symptoms i have people that i work with where the only symptom of gut imbalance is the fact that they have eczema or acne or mm -hmm. um brain fog like i see a lot of like anxiety and um like mental clarity stuff with gut health but like digestion is totally good bowel movements are totally good so it's it's complex in the fact where there's no person that will always will show the exact same symptoms but it just goes to show that i mean you might your skin issues might just might be a gut thing and but you have no other symptoms of gut imbalance or your again your like your headaches or your brain fog or just you can't you don't have that sharp mental clarity a lot of times that can come from that as well so it's that's a huge place that I'm starting when I'm working with people is because it controls so many things. Yes. Yes, it does. And I am one of those people that it comes out on my skin. It, I have gut issues, like my stomach is killing me. Um, headaches, brain fog, all of it. Like I'm, <laughs> I do not do well when I am. Yeah, you can, you can, it touches all the areas for you. It, oh, yes, it does. And um, so, yeah, but that was great to know that, yeah, some people, it can only affect your skin mm -hmm. or it's only affecting your brain fog or mm -hmm. something along those lines. And yeah, I mean, if there's any part of you that isn't performing optimally, optimally, like you said, um, that's a sign of something's something's not right there. We got inflammation. We got we got something that's not not good. <laughs> right. And it's not something, you know, <laughs> press the panic button and just like, oh, you know, I break out once in a while. Oh my God, like, you know, I'm gonna have horrible. And it's like, no, no, no. Like let's just start paying attention to things that are causing inflammation or let's just kind of start paying attention to some of these things or, you know, start implementing some of these practices. It's not like a you kind of start paying attention to things. And I think people don't realize how good they actually can feel. And that's kind of the thing is, you know, it's a lot of these are, are very much so lifestyle things. Like whenever I'm recommending something to somebody, I mean, yes, there's certain times where it's like, yeah, we do something for a specific period of time. We don't, you know, we don't continue on various rounds of supplements or protocols for an ex always an extended period of time by any means. But a lot of what is really going to make people feel optimal is these small consistent things that you feel like you can now change in your lifestyle, like getting better sleep or um, filtering your water and like all these different nutritional changes. Cause if you do what you were doing before, after you finish working with a practitioner or after you get help for something, you're just going to go back to how you were feeling before. So it really is shifting. It's, it's really like, I don't just adjust people's spine. I like to adjust your lifestyle because that's, what's truly going to like lead you on the trajectory of, okay, we got rid of this symptom. Now let's just prevent anything from being able to come back in the future. I love that. I love that. Um, so for someone listening <clears throat> who is like, okay, yes, I have poor gut issues. Mm -hmm. um, where can they start? So is there certain foods that are known to be inflammatory that they can start cutting out right now? to maybe improve that, you know, whether it is their, their stomach or whether it's coming out in their skin or, um, or their brain fog or something like that. Is there, ba what are the basics that someone mm -hmm. can start with to start improving gut health? So I would say, I mean, I talked about gluten because I do feel like whether people have true gluten sensitivities or wheat sensitivities or not, it's not serving most people. Uh, that I see if if not really, it's not really serving anybody, whether you can better tolerate it or not. So but the good part about it is eating real foods don't contain gluten in the first place. So mm. vegetables, fruits, proteins, um, if you can tolerate dairy, like dairy is kind of an iffy one for some people I know. Um, but I, I, I like to kind of like cut one thing at a time, like I don't want it to be like, a because then when you cut a bunch of things at once, and you've and you're newer to kind of this whole thing, it becomes super unsustainable. You do it for a little bit and then you're just like, oh, well, screw the whole thing. I'm not doing it anymore. So yeah. I'd say like start with one thing at a time. And if you want to add it back in to see how it tolerates, do it, but you but you you would kind of spread it out. So if you 
thought, you know, if you are like, okay, I'm going to limit dairy for a little bit. I'm just going to really focus on whole foods, shopping perimeter, the grocery store, you know, leaning more on like rooted vegetables. Maybe you do some like rice as a carbohydrate instead of, you know, pasta or uh, whatever that might look like for you. Or, I mean, there's tons of, and just because something's gluten-free doesn't mean that it's super healthy. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a lot of gluten-free stuff that has a lot of ingredients and a lot of additives. There are a lot of great brands out there too. So just like turn over your stuff and just start making yourself familiar about ingredients. I'd say the less amount of ingredients, the better. Um, If it's a novel, no, (laughs) like the ingredients list, because I've I've been gluten-free for six, six, yeah, six years now. And I've learned that what you just said, like it, it just because it says gluten free on the front. Yeah, like um, some of the gluten free breads are, they're yeah. just, they're huge. And then there's like, there's oils and there's bad oils in them. And I'm like, this is no healthier Mm-mm. than, I mean, yeah, there's no gluten in it, but it's no healthier. But there definitely is, there definitely is amazing swaps for a lot of different things. There really is. Just turn it over and look, kind of start to familiarize yourself with the ingredients. And as the ingredients are kind of just all whole foods, that are, you know, like, like a pasta is a good example. I love like the red lentil or the chickpea pastas. And the ones that I get, the only ingredient is organic chickpea or organic lentil. Like that's the only ingredient. And so that's significantly better than some gluten-free pastas where it's like laundry list of stuff. You're starting to kind of familiarize yourself with mostly eating whole foods. If you want, if you're still not feeling a hundred percent and you're like, you know, there's still, there's still something going on. One, ask yourself, okay, Am I super stressed when I'm eating? Because that's a huge one with like when people get immediate digestive discomfort or when they feel like they're not digesting their food. Again, that goes back to the whole concept of we're in this realm of we're constantly running from a tiger. Our body digests in a parasympathetic state. So sympathetic is kind of that fight or flight. Parasympathetic is the rest and digest. A lot of people are working at their computers. A lot of people are eating in the car. A lot of people are just, you know, we're not being mindful when we're eating. I know that sounds so silly and it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. It makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It makes a huge difference because your brain, I mean, your, your eyes, like what, like if you're watching something, right, you're stimulated. You're not thinking about what you're eating. That's why we can overeat when we're in front of the TV because we're like, we're not fully processing it. So sit down, take some time to just sit and chew your meal. If you're doing that, you're eating whole foods and you're like, man, I still am not feeling, I feel a hundred percent. I don't feel a hundred percent yet. Okay. Maybe you can start keeping like a food journal and saying, so we can maybe start, you can start to see for yourself, like if there's certain things that you might be eating or if there's a certain time during the day, just so you can kind of start to find patterns for yourself. That's something that when I'm asking people a lot of questions, they're like, oh, I don't really pay attention. A lot of kind of figuring out stuff for yourself is just being in tune with what's going on in your own body, which is, which is hard because we aren't really told how to do that, or we aren't really kind of, um, pushed to be able to do that. But I mean, that's a huge way that I can get information on how to help people is helping them be more in tune. So we can kind of better play around with things, but start taking a food journal. And then if you feel that, you know, it's, Oh shoot, you know, it's every time I'm, having, you know, some cheese on, on something that I feel that it's coming. It's like, okay, well, you know, like, let's just limit it for a little bit. Or if it's like a regular cheese, you can see if you can get a raw cheese. Cause sometimes it's, if your body struggles to digest like the enzyme, like the lactose enzyme or the lactase enzyme, like a, like a raw cheese would have something like that. But again, maybe just like cut it for a little bit, see what you notice. I'd, I, it's so it's, it's frustrating because people want to be told like an absolute, but it's so much of a lot of this stuff is kind of experimenting, playing around with things, but you can kind of that from there, be able to say, okay, I notice it every time at dinner. Okay. Well, maybe cause at dinner, you, uh, maybe you're eating a bigger meal at dinner. Maybe you're drinking a lot of water with your meals, which will dilute our own stomach acid and digestive enzymes. So you know, hydrating is incredibly important. Please do that. But just don't do it right around the time that you're eating a meal. Because I mean, if you think about it, water dilutes an acid. So our stomach acid is so crucial for breaking down our food. That's a huge reason, especially if you're feeling super bloated after a meal. But then again, we think about stress, stress also dilutes stomach acid. So everything goes together. And so when you start really focusing on one lifestyle habit, like just decreasing stress in general, or being more mindful at your meal, it's going to have so many downline and, uh, ways that it's positively impacting you. 
you are amazing. You're so knowledgeable. And I, <laughs> every you. point, every point you just touched on just from that question, I was like, yes, yes, I feel like yes. I'm blabbing. I'm just like worried no. about all things like digestive health. <laughs> no, I am like eating it up over here. Cause I'm like, you know, you talked about mindful eating and like, oh, that's so true. Like stop eating while you're driving. Like, just Stop eating while you're driving, yes. please. Yes. And I'm so bad at it. I did it this morning too. And I, I'm like so mad at myself for doing that. Um, even before this podcast, I was like, oh, why did I eat while on my way here? Like, I'm just, it's throwing me off because yeah, I'm driving with my knee. I'm eating my breakfast, know. you know, but um, yeah, mindful eating. And like you said, the water drinking, I'm so bad at that too. Um, and I, and I know a lot of people probably are, mm -hmm. is a lot you're of eating. Are. Oh, okay. Let's see how fast we can get this food down because I got to move on to the next thing. Exactly. So I'm going to drink. So it just, you know, goes down it, 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 I can chew it fast and eat it fast. And, um, yeah, you're diluting your own stomach acids, which mm -hmm. you need to break that food down. So, right. And then wow. we lean on like a Tums or, and I'm only saying that cause you said that earlier. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm picking on you a little bit. Um, no, I'm a but, I was a Tums girl. It was so bad. So that bad. Or like the anti-acids and like all those mm -hmm. things do over time is just weaken your stomach acid even further. So yeah, like they might provide like a little bit of, uh, support maybe in the, in the meantime, but down the road, if you're like, man, I just cannot, I see that a lot when people are on like these proton pump inhibitors, you're only supposed to be on them for like three to six months, max, max people are on them for years. And oh I'm like, these poor people gosh. have no B vitamins. These poor people aren't digesting anything that they're eating because it's just, you know, I mean, it's just weakening your stomach acid mm -hmm. in the hopes that that's not going to cause more reflux. But in reality, a lot of reflux is actually due to low stomach acid. That's a whole rabbit hole, but yeah, it's just, you can see what I mean. It's like very, it's very backwards. Yeah. Oh, and, and, um, so I want to go backwards a little bit, mm -hmm. um, back to skin. Mm -hmm. So we touched on that a little bit and how it, your gut health can affect your skin mm -hmm. and, you know, breakouts and all the things. Well, a lot of things that I'm or a lot of treatments that I'm seeing um, women, men, you know, people in their 20s going through, you know, we're like, OK, we're an adult. We're past the puberty stage. You know, we aren't expecting to have acne at mm -hmm. this age. You know, I'm 28, 20 or I'm sorry, I'm 29. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> I'm 29. And, you know, I know people who are close in my age who are dealing with acne right now in life. And I'm just like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And so they're being prescribed things like Accutane, like birth control, oh. mm -hmm. um, all of these, you know, these treatments trying to help their acne. And so, but it's not addressing the root cause. And no. so can you talk on that a little bit? Like what we need to be doing instead of, you know, throwing Accutane at the problem or throwing birth control at it? Yep. So a lot of, especially as it relates to the gut. So how to maybe know like, okay, it maybe is my acne a little bit more hormonal based is my acne, maybe gut related, gut related acne and skin conditions can kind of be there. There's no rhyme or reason for them. They don't really always pop up during hormonal fluctuations. They don't, um, they don't, they're kind of inconsistent or maybe constant. Like that could be the case for like eczema or acne or whatever. Like it's, it's kind of, there. Um, whereas hormonal acne generally, generally will come at certain hormonal fluctuations. So maybe around ovulation or maybe the week before your period or on your period, like there's kind of some hormonal swing that is going on around during that time. That's not the case for everybody because some hormones like uh, blood sugar relation or insulin, insulin being the hormone, I mean, that could be disrupted all day, all month long. And so again, that that's like the acne that is especially like the jaw and cheek where it's like always there. That's something where it's like, okay, let's maybe pay attention to like how we're balancing our blood sugar. Are we eating super balanced meals? Are we relying on carbs? And like by carbs, I mean like just eating carbohydrates with caffeine and then crashing two hours later and then doing the same thing again and then doing the same thing again. Um, whereas a balanced meal, we want to have, you know, protein forward, good amount of fiber, eat your carbs last at your meal to balance that blood sugar a little bit better. Um, so, I mean, all those are a lot of root causes that I can see for skin, like a very kind of quick 
quick glance, but it's, it's so complex because I mean, I still, I still struggle with mine. And so I run stool tests on myself every year and I'm kind of like, still liver is a huge liver, at least is a huge thing for me. Cause kind of at the root of a lot of hormonal acne is actually more so liver congestion. So is that because of maybe being on birth control? Is that because of like pharmaceutical? Not always, but um, is it maybe just, I mean, some people are just predisposed to not being as efficiently at processing things as others. I mean, I'm sure we all have those people that they can go out and drink or whatever. And like, they're totally fine. Then you have people that are like, they have one and they just feel like complete garbage. Like that was me. Um, so I was like, why can't I tolerate anything? So I always knew that I was like way more sensitive to, I can't do perfumes and I walk around our neighborhood and I just can smell people's fabric softeners. And I just, I can't do it. I can't do it. So I know that I have to kind of love my liver and like really help support that more than maybe somebody else would. Right. So that's kind of where it comes down to, you know, what I do might be different than somebody else, but that is a big thing for root cause hormonal stuff. Cause your liver is processing your hormones and everything. I mean, your hormones helping to release bile to stimulate digestion, your liver is processing all your hormones, it's processing all the food that we're eating, it's processing and things that we're exposed to on a daily basis, right? Like it's, it's a, an amazing filter. Um, but sometimes it just needs a little bit of extra help for some people. So I mean, that could, that's a huge support when I'm seeing a lot of skin issues. And that's where Accutane kind of comes in and kind of screws stuff up a little bit, because it can heavily impact your microbiome negatively. And it can heavily play like people's liver enzymes on Accutane can be scary high sometimes. So yes, it might help in the moment. But when you feel like you have to keep going on Accutane multiple times, like I see this in some popular influencers, and I'm like, man, you know, it's just, it's scary, because like, what are these things actually doing? Right, repetitively. And leading to, I, I mean, are these things too, that not only are what they're doing to your body, but specifically like fertility. I mean, it is, I know. are these things that like are affecting, you know, things like Accutane for sure. Birth control, I think mm -hmm. is known that it affects fertility. Um, and so is Accutane another one that these things are, you know, possibly going to lead to fertility issues down the road when you decide to, to have children. I definitely have theories on I feel like our generation does struggle with fertility more because of birth control and just because of all these different things that we were put on I mean not saying like you if you go on birth control it's going to affect your fertility 100% no but for some people you know they're they're not told that it's going to it can take their time their cycle time to re-regulate I mean it probably took when I came off birth control it probably took me a, a good year, year and a half to like really get a handle on everything, like for yeah. it to be consistent, for it to not be skipping months for, you know, for all those different things. And so, you know, it's, it's not to, I, I just feel like it's still kind of such an unknown territory, but I mean, there's some people that they go on birth control from the time that they get their period until they're in their mid thirties. And they're like, okay, I'm going to come off and I want to have kids like tomorrow. Mm -hmm you know, maybe, maybe that can happen, but I don't know if it's that easy for, I know it's not that easy for everybody. And I just feel like people aren't told, Hey, you know, birth control causes a lot of nutrient depletions and birth control can, you know, be, can cause some congestion with your liver. So before we work on getting pregnant, let's work on, you know, rebalancing that stuff a little bit. I tell people that if you give your, I'd say, give yourself a good six months to a year, ideally, you know, to really just give your body all the nutrients that it's depleted from zinc, B vitamins, so many things that are very crucial to fertility that birth control causes depletions on. So, you know, you're not going to fix 10 years of depletions in a few months, but it's, it's going to give you a better start. So that was like a huge thing for me too. I mean, when I came off, I think I was 23. I got engaged when I was 24. Gosh, that feels like forever ago at this point. But yes, I, I was like, I don't want to have kids right now, but I want to have kids in the future. And I feel like I'm very sensitive to these things. Like I want to just, I want to just understand my body better. And so um, it's been, a, it's, it's so empowering too. I mean, again, I've been off birth control for almost seven years. I am able to track my cycle. You know, there's, if birth control is the, is the main reason they are on it. I told, I understand. And I think it's good that we have options like that, but I also want people to know we also have other options. I mean, 
obviously physical barrier method, but I mean, it's so cool to be able to track your cycle because we don't all ovulate on the same days or, you know, like just if you might ovulate on day 15 of your cycle, I might ovulate on day 17. We're all very different. And it's cool when you can understand that because then when you get to wanting to have kids, it's so easy. It's not so it's not so easy. I shouldn't say that, but it's 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 so much easier because you're so much more understanding mm-hmm. of your body. I just had this conversation with actually um, a good friend of ours. She had gotten pregnant, no issues, and you know, postpartum, really working on nutrient depletion. So we were really, like really ramping that up. She's like, but we're trying again, and I'm I'm struggling, and like I'm I'm doing it on the days that my app says to do it. And I was like, you can't go based off of that because you're just getting your 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 cycles kind of just coming back now. You should like test when you're ovulating because we all ovulate on different times. She texted me yesterday. And she's pregnant because she started testing when she's ovulating. She was giving her body more nutrients. And so it just goes to show that it's whether your goal is to get pregnant or whether your goal is to not like being able to truly understand how your own cycle works can be Mm -hmm. so cool. It's so empowering. Absolutely. Um, Do you I know there's and is it an aura ring? Aura ring is a huge that one because that syncs to natural okay. cycles now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was going to ask, do you recommend those um, for people who are wanting to not be on birth control, but want to birth control? Yeah. Um, is that a good one? That's a good one. Um, I don't wear an aura ring. I wear a, a temp drop. So it's like a, I wear it like on my arm at nighttime and it takes my temp. Um, just because I know that I'm not going to be compliant at taking my temperature every morning. Natural Cycles does have its own thermometer. If you didn't do it through the Aura Ring, like you can take it the good old fashioned way to take your temp. And the reason for that is because we're looking to see temps rise after ovulation to kind of confirm, okay, we've ovulated. We can also look at cervical mucus, but that for people who are like, I don't really want to do a lot of work. I want to, I I don't want to have to remember something like a wearable Mm -hmm. is, is very nice and convenient. But if you, like want to do it the good old fashioned way, you can also just take your temp every single morning and, you know, you can get a lot of information from that too. Okay. Yeah. And so what do you think about um, non-hormonal birth controls? What are, What is your mm. take on those? So like Because I know those IV. are options that are given, you know, at, at your OBGYN, they're like, well, if you don't want to have a hormonal birth control, there are mm-hmm. non-hormonal options. So what what is your take on those? I think... I think there is a risk to everything. There's benefits and risks to everything. Um, A benefit to being on a non-hormonal one is, you know, it's non-hormonal. A risk would be, especially to something like the copper is, um, we're finding that the copper might not be staying in the cervix Mm -hmm. area. Like we can find higher copper levels in women who have been on this for a period of time. Um, especially if you, it, so essentially the way that it works is the copper is creating like micro inflammation to kill sperm. So you can't get pregnant. So yes, you're cycling and all that type of stuff, but what is, why are we creating inflammation in a small amount to kill something? Like, I don't know, part of like, that's just where my mind goes. I'm like, how long can we sustain that for? And like, is that good? And so because it creates a little bit of inflammation to kill the sperm, it can make periods much heavier and much more painful. And so if you already struggle with something like that, that's, that's probably not going to be a super great option for you. When we look at something like Mirena, which uh, is a progesterone uh, form of IUD, I find that that also doesn't come without risks because a lot of people don't like, it says you, you could get your cycle, you bleed. I find that's like the very, very, very minute subset of the population. There's people that have been on that for years and they're like, I can't tell you the last time I bled. I'm like, well, that's also not good. Um, and that's not good for like even people who are on hormonal birth, like pills that mm-hmm. skip months. Like we are supposed to build our uterine lining, shed our uterine lining if we're not pregnant, build and shed. Like that's just supposed to happen. That's just, you know, why we're trying to like cheat nature. Yeah. And that sometimes doesn't always work out super great. So I think, you know, I think I just tell people like weigh the pros and the cons, see what is, see what makes the most sense for you. But it, it even with it being like an IUD or something, it's it it doesn't always come without certain risks or side effects. Mm-hmm. But as I mean, as does tracking your cycle. I mean, the risk with that would be like you got to pay attention. You can't just open like a flow app and say, "Oh yeah, I'm in my fertile window." When 
and you're not paying attention like when you actually are like if you're true so there there is risks even with like the more natural way like you have to be on it you have to be paying attention to your body because i mean unless you want to get pregnant and then you know by all means just you know don't worry about it but that obviously can be a risk as well and like there's margin of error and stuff like that so it's just important and so i'm not saying like my way is 100 percent bulletproof and high and mighty i'm just saying like you just have to pay attention right exactly and so if you are somebody who is wanting to um you know repair your hormones you know balance them out and you're wanting to seek more of a functional way to do so with you know sup more like natural supplements um i know that there are and you made a post about this that there are some supplements that are not recommended and um why it's probably also really important to work with someone like you, a professional in this field, um, when you are thinking about going on these things, because it can probably th throw you off worse than I what you I think I know which one you're talking about. So, okay. so DIM is a supplement that, uh, yes. DIM is diendol methane. It's a, it's found in a lot of hormone balancing supplements. And so people are like, and this was me too, like I was getting a lot of breakouts on, on birth control and I was like, I will try anything. I was just going on Amazon. I'm like hormone balancing. And it's like the first thing that pops up. And then I get on Vitex and it's like, now I know I'm like, oh my God, you do not take that on birth control. Cause then I was getting breakthrough bleeding. I'm like, what is going on? Things were worsening. So I would not just blindly recommend taking something if you don't know if it's right for your situation uh, in terms of like hormone balancing, right? Like DIM is a common one. It's in a lot of hormone balancing supplements. Like it's a, you know, a list of ingredients with probably other great things too, but the reason it's not super great if you don't know where you're at is because it can really detoxify your estrogen. And if your estrogen is fine and healthy, we don't want to lower it even more because I've had people who, you know, feel amazing. And then they go on dim and they're like, I feel menopausal. I have tons of vaginal dryness. My skin is so dry. I feel like I can cry at anything. And I was like, okay, that's not normal because um, your hormones completely went down because you didn't need to be on this but there's people that do it does help them it does help met them metabolize their estrogen if that's something they're struggling with and you know that's just one example I mean there's definitely some adaptogenic herbs that can be a little bit more gentle that people can take but when that's like the big one for me it's like please do not go on that unless you know exactly what your hormones look like I know we're we were on hormones but I want to kind of mm -hmm. shift just a little bit um and th this is kind of like broad so if you're someone who is feeling hopeless, you're discouraged by constantly getting okay blood work, um, you know, your doctor is like, you know, I everything looks good. You know, we, we really don't see any issues here. Mm -hmm. um, but you're still feeling abnormal. You're like firing on, you're not firing on all, all cylinders. You're fatigued. You're constantly needing caffeine throughout the day. Um, you have anxiety, mood swings, all these things. Um and and gut issues um i don't feel like this is discussed enough but is could it be high cortisol dysregulated nervous system um can you talk about that like if those things mm. all pertain to this definitely definitely a lot of people do have some sort of dysregulated nervous system whether they aren't taking what and it's like a double edged sword too because we're wired and tired. We're so tired during the day. So we just do more caffeine multiple times throughout the day, but then we get to go to sleep when we're like, we can finally restore and like take stress off of our body, but we can't get to sleep because our mind won't stop thinking we're exhausted, but we can't, we can't think, or we can't stop thinking. And therefore it prevents us from sleeping. So I'd say if you are kind of suspecting, like you're on this hamster wheel, you're super burnt out, you feel burnt out, you have low energy, but you're kind of you're wired and tired at the same time, especially as it pertains to sleep, I'd say circadian rhythm health is one of the best things that we can do to help take stress off the body and to help shift our cortisol patterns because cortisol is good. I mean, we we need cortisol, but with all hormones, it's that Goldilocks amount. So we want higher amounts of cortisol in the morning, into the afternoon, it kind of starts to come down that two to three o'clock is where it generally hits low for for a lot of people. So if you feel that a little bit harder, that's a great time to maybe add some more electrolyte support or make sure you're getting in, you know, minerals or 
make sure you're balancing your blood sugar too. Cause a lot of people, if they're just having more carbohydrate, just small, tiny little meals, we're snacking throughout the day, instead of having like actual meals, you're going to feel it a lot when that afternoon crash comes. And then as it pertains to circadian rhythm, our body, like look at babies, look at animals. They love, like we, they, they thrive on routine. We do too. We just get out of it so much. So set a bedtime for yourself and stick to it. Set a wake up time and stick to it. I know it sounds silly, but, and it should be, you know, most days, like on the weekends, if you're going to bed at midnight and then you're waking up at 10, but then during the week you have to wake up at five, it's like your body's traveling from one time zone all the way across to another. And it's doing that on a day, on a weekly basis. So you're getting, you're jet lagging yourself. So I say like, you know, if you can stick to it, it like as close as you possibly can, that's best. Um, but I mean, think about how thrown off people are with the time zone change that mm -hmm. happens, the daylight savings or whatever. It's just, yeah, just one hour. Yeah. Just, just one, one hour. hour but people yeah. are doing that to themselves every single weekend and not realizing it. Or, you know, I see this too, where people, they do pretty good nutrition wise during the week, but then on the weekend, it's like mm -hmm. they're in college again and it's just a free for all. <laughs> I, I think, I think a hard truth is, and I was talking to my husband about this the other day. I'm like, we need a little bit more discipline as a society. You know, there's a lot of just really crappy, super hyper palatable and yummy, yummy in quotes, because I think we can change our taste buds. We, we need to have a little bit more discipline for ourselves. And so maybe that means like, again, setting a bedtime for yourself and like really forcing yourself to if you feel like you're struggling to fall asleep, like maybe you work in some breath work practices or you work in some meditation or you just stop drinking caffeine very late into the day. I mean, caffeine has like a half life of eight hours. So even if it doesn't directly affect you, you know, you can drink cups of coffee and your feet, you know, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't mean that it's not affecting your sleep cycle. So I'd say like if you can really focus on getting to bed, working on maybe working in a whole night time routine, which that could be it's a whole probably episode by itself waking up and kind of setting these kind of like little lifestyle rules for yourself. Like you hydrate before you have caffeine. You don't do caffeine super late into the day. You're working on, okay, I'm usually a grab and go person. I'm not really eating super nutrient dense meals, but I'm going to start preparing some meals that I can have that I can still grab and go, but are going to be filled with a lot more nutrition. A lot of people ha would have a lot more energy if they really just started focusing on more real foods, because mm -hmm. so many things that come from packages and stuff, I mean, they're just completely void and stripped of nutrients. And when you can start eating real food again, you're like, wow, how great this feels to actually have energy where I'm not relying on caffeine. I know that's silly, but like, I've seen, I've seen this so much, like, especially within the last few weeks of just like we really need to make some concise, just food swapping recommendations. You know, we need to just kind of get people eating real foods again. And you, you really can start to feel a difference. Oh, yeah. And another thing, too, is and I think this also goes with like spiking your cortisol first thing in the morning is I know a lot, so many of us, you know, we'll go we'll wake up in the morning. We don't have anything on our stomach you know, we'll get ready, we'll leave the house for work or whatever. And we stop through Starbucks on our way and we get a sugary latte with a double pump of espresso. And, um, and that that's what starts our day. And so yep. is that like detrimental, basically, to your body it's in the not morning? Great. It's okay. not great. <laughs> it's not great. I'd say, okay, can we say, all right, let's hydrate first thing in the morning. Cause then the worst thing that people do is like, they, they immediately go right to the coffee pot. Um, can we hydrate first? Can we at least like get some hydration? Maybe we throw some trace minerals or like a small little pinch of good quality salt in there. Let, let's at least hydrate first. If you're going through the Starbucks line or whatever, can we get something that maybe is not going to have 30 grams of sugar in it? Can we get some, like, if you're going to get something like I, I, those places are like, junk food but it's really like a junk food place if you're not getting like legitimate coffee like getting like a, a black Americana, coffee which is just yeah. espresso and water like that's mm -hmm. like I'm not anti-coffee I drink a I drink a espresso every morning but I for me I like to do it after I've eaten breakfast and a really cool thing that you can do too to really help your natural energy levels is wait to have caffeine 60 to 90 minutes which I know is hard for some people but it does really help to 
allow your natural cortisol to come up without artificially spiking it every single morning. You can definitely take it a step further and have it 60 to 90 minutes later, but also have it with some food because it's going to be a lot less stressful on your system. If you can't do that, maybe just ha- add some healthy fats to it, or maybe you like some collagen in your coffee to just, I, again, that's like better than probably the swap, right? Like that's better than the sugary latte that probably has more sugar than you should be consuming all day. <laughs> right. So we talked about all the 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 bad things that you can potentially be doing to your body. Right. Um, let's talk about detox. Okay. And how you can like ways you can detox, how often you should be detoxing um, and what are things you need to be to- detoxing your body of? Mm, good question. So, I mean, really, our body detoxifies every single day. We our liver is constantly processing hormones and chemicals. And, you know, we do have this amazing internal filtration system, liver, kidneys, bowels. Um, but then on my side, I see so many people's bowels don't move. There's people who maybe they have a few bowel movements a week, we should be having at least one to three bowel movements a day. And so because that's a huge way that we get rid of waste. So if we're not getting rid of waste through our stool, that stuff just sits there and our body has to reprocess it again. Um, so I'd say like being able to have healthy bowel movements is, is crucial. Um, if you maybe were on birth control or um, feel like you kind of resonate when I was talking, like you have maybe chemical sensitivities, alcohol doesn't sit super well with you. Um, maybe you're suspecting that your detoxification doesn't work as well. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to like go on a full on cleanse per se. Sometimes, I mean, I use those a lot clinically. It kind of depends on the situation, but I mean, there's things that we can even do on a daily basis to just help our internal cleansing system work a little bit more efficiently. Uh, I'm a huge fan of dandelion tea, like or burdock. Those are amazing, amazing herbs to just, I mean, we, we have it every single night in our tea. Like my husband has detox is a lot more efficient than mine, but he can still consume it and it's not going to hurt him. You know, it's not like you, it's not, everybody can be doing a lot of these things. Rooted vegetables are amazing. Beets, carrots, artichokes are really great. Cruciferous vegetables are really amazing for our internal cleansing system. Plus they add good fiber and bulk to the stool to like help that move really well. Um, consuming liver, like so beef liver, chicken liver. I know it sounds silly because people are like, that sounds disgusting and I'll never do that. It contains all the nutrients that your liver needs to work efficiently. That's kind of a whole thing that I got into a few years ago um, was was incorporating that a little bit more into my diet, just a little bit. Um, so tonight I'll do like ground beef and I'll add, you know, probably like an ounce or two of ground liver to it. It's you don't need a lot, a little goes a long way. Uh, but again, it there's this ancestral wisdom that says like supports like. So, you know, eating heart will, you know, it's got tons of CoQ10. It's got all these amazing things to support your heart. Liver, same thing. It's got lots of vitamin A, lots of B vitamins, selenium, zinc, all these great things. Um, So there's, I mean, from both a plant-based and animal-based perspective, there's a lot of different foods, herbs, things that we can just be having on a daily basis. But on the same token, to better support our liver, we should be also limiting things that hinder it. So alcohol is a huge one. And um, it's something that I think a lot of people realize when they start limiting it, how, how it is truly affecting them, whether it's anxiety or skin or um, just consuming not super quality food when they're drinking, you know, there's so many different types of things. Um, And then just also kind of taking a look at the ingredients that are in your personal care products or that are in the food that you're eating. Like, is there a lot of additives? Is there a lot of just ingredients that you don't, you don't understand why they're there or what they do? And not that we all need to just be ingredient experts. But I, I think I think it is empowering as a consumer that we can understand what's going in our food. And I don't think you need to be a food scientist to understand those things. I think everybody should be able to look at a food label and say, you know what? I don't really like that ingredient because I understand what it does for the body. And there's a lot of cool apps out there that can kind of help you process that. But, or, and just, you know, people, I see people in the store and like they kind of are scanning things and it's kind of educating. I think those things are wonderful. And I think, not it's not meant to be fear mongering, but it's just it's cool to say like to learn about those things. But with that, you know, we don't need to read food ingredient labels on food that's actually real. So you know, being able to focus on honestly a lot more of that stuff is is really 
super, super powerful. 100%. Um, and especially if you can't pronounce an ingredient that's in the food. <laughs> yeah. Because when I was reading the back of, I think it was peanut butter <laughs> the other day, like Jif peanut butter. or oh, yeah. God. And I was like, what is a, I want to say it was like a diglyceride. I'm like, I've never even heard of that. What, what is a diglyceride? <laughs> I mean, it was just some, like. It, 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 I mean, so glyceride is some type of fat, but there's, there's some type of like additive in GIF. I can't remember. I remember my college There's a roommate. bunch. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch that like I was trying to pronounce and I'm like, okay, we're done with, <laughs> we're done with this. <laughs> I know it's, it's crazy. My college roommate was like, for when we like lived together in college, she's like, you and your family eat healthier than anybody I've ever seen, but I don't understand how you eat Jif. Cause she was like, she got me into like, you just need to eat real peanut butter. I'm like, I didn't realize that, you know, it's just like yeah. it's certain things like that you kind of like learn along the way. But yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff in conventional peanut butter that is not super great. Yes. Yes. And I, I want to hit one more point. Um, and that is a, a reel that you posted um, not long ago. And I thought it was an interesting post. And um, what you said in the reel that I thought was so interesting is that Big Pharma made $1.7 trillion profit in the previous year. Um, not one penny of that went to helping people understand how to live a healthier life. Um, there is not a single pharmaceutical drug out there without a side effect and a nutrient depletion, which will then be treated by another drug. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to bring this to the show because that post should absolutely get your wheels turning. You know what what you said in that post. Um, that was a viral it, sound. So that that yeah. wasn't my voice. I took that that sound bite was like going around somewhere. And oh I oh my gosh, I thought it. that was your really? voice one hundred percent. I thought that was your voice. Okay. No, no, I wish it was because I would that would be so creative. Um, but no, I took it and I put it with just like all the things I actually do to live a healthy life. Yeah. Um, and I just made one the other day too that we are one of two countries that allow direct to consumer pharmaceutical marketing and it just goes to show I mean yeah. I mean I see it like what the Super Bowl whenever we watch football whenever we watch sports like whenever we're watching like cable tv which is not a lot um but even on streaming platforms like Hulu and stuff it's like god every time there's a commercial it's like a drug mm -hmm. you know oh, yeah which is fine like if people need these things I'm glad that they are there I'm glad that these things exist however from my standpoint we have we're spending so much money on healthcare but we are so sick. And like, this is the first, we're like the first generation that we are expected to not outlive. Like the, the life expectancy is continuing to decrease, which is frightening because why are we spending all this money on healthcare, but we aren't living as long. And if we are living as long, is it quality? Is it, are we healthy? Are we just on a billion different things to like keep us going? Cause I don't want to live like that. I'd love to just continue to live my life as I do now unmedicated I mean that's obviously a goal but and I hope to be able to get there but I don't think even if we are living longer it's always better and so back to your point there is a lot spent on obviously pharmaceutical but how much of that I mean I'm sure people can think about this too if you go to your doctor and you say I have anxiety and they're like okay let, here let's take this there are they mm -hmm. asking like what are you eating what yeah. are, are you deficient in b vitamins that we know can cause anxiety are you take are you deficient in magnesium do we are we asking these questions of deficiency because the reason that you're having anxiety is not because you're deficient in an anti-anxiety pill the right. reason you're depressed is not because you're deficient in an ssri like those things i'm not discrediting that they help people and I think that it's wonderful if people can be on a healing journey while they're figuring out why that's actually happening to them. Mm -hmm. But it's just so frustrating to see like these things constantly being pushed and like Ozempic is a huge thing. It's like, oh, you're not seeing weight loss. Like just go ask your doctor about Ozempic. And people are like, okay, you know, versus like, what are you eating? What are you eating? What are you doing? Like, how is your stress levels? What is going on? <laughs> it's so incredibly frustrating to see because it, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, instant gratification. Yes. Well, I, I love everything you just said. Oh, my gosh. Like, chills. I love it. And, and, and it is it is so it's so true. Like, it, and it's sad. It really is sad. So I love that you are sharing your knowledge and trying to spread the word to the masses as much as you can through I'm trying. social media, your podcast, 
um, and then your practice. And, and I think that's incredible. And I, I'm so glad to have made your acquaintance now. And um, and I, I hope that listeners will love this just as much as I have and really take away a ton of information that you've shared in this episode. Um, and I, I want to talk about next is where can listeners find you? So where can they follow you on social media? Um, what is your website? And then also dive into the fact that you have one-on-one functional health sessions in office or virtual, which Mm -hmm. you talked about a little bit, is that you can help anybody anywhere. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you're in California, Canada, Florida, wherever. Yeah, we can help. And um, and also that you um, also have online functional health memberships, which contain courses, protocols, content, and webinars, which yeah. is amazing. That is That seems like so much all in one. So can you tell us where can people find you, what the website is, and a little bit about those things that you have to offer? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say I'm most active on Instagram. My handle is uh, at Dr. Haley Schaff. I do post a little bit on TikTok too, same thing, at Dr. Haley Schaff. And then I have my website at Dr. Haley shop. I keep it super streamlined. And then um, in terms of my membership and one-on-ones, those all can be found there, but essentially it's kind of like a tiered system for people who I, I, cause I do understand there is a barrier to entry with functional medicine. Like it's not accepted by insurance. It's out of pocket. I understand that. So that's kind of where I created my membership where it's giving you a little bit more access to a practitioner. It's giving you all these different courses and protocols so that if you're not quite ready to jump in, you have a lot of different things that you can really get started on. So that's super fun. I love, I love funneling stuff into there. I do a webinar every single month and then there's just, I'm constantly adding content to that. And then obviously I have my one-on-ones, which uh, we take kind of a full deep dive into what pretty much a lot of the different things that we talked about today. Like what are your stressors? What does your nutrition look like? What, what does I want to know like everything about your lifestyle because that helps me be able to better figure out what's going on and you know if we do order if if ordering testing is right we'll order it it's by no means required but it's you know it's sometimes helpful I don't know if you've dove dove down kind of that route with your journey but Mm -hmm. you know it's it's helpful um but it's by no means required so you know we have access to be able to do all that type of stuff but yeah it's um it's really fun I have my podcast alpha health and wellness radio and you know just trying to get the world, get the word out there to the world. Yes. That's all. That's what it's all about. Like, especially when you're super passionate about something, it's easy to, to really spread the message. And totally. I love the message that you have to share. Thank you. Um, and so with that, thank you so, so much for coming on and sharing all of the information that you did. Um, I, I know for a fact that you're going to gain a lot of followers and, and interest oh, in your you. practice from this because of everything that you had to say was just amazing. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful trip thank to Costa you. Rica. I am so jealous. I'll be living vicariously through maybe if you post stories or whatnot. Um, oh, yeah. yeah have a, I can't have keep a it wonderful. to myself. I'm like always sharing <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that because yeah, when I'm stuck here, I want to pretend I'm somewhere else at least. So I exactly. just look for people's stories. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is this has been wonderful. Maybe next time it'll be in person. I'll fly out or something fun. Absolutely. There will be a part two, people. Promise yeah, I you love that. that. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. As always, I appreciate you all so much for listening. My goal is for these episodes to at least help one person in some aspect of their life. So if you like what you hear, don't forget to follow, like, subscribe to the show, as well as follow us on social media at Inside Voice Pod. Thanks.